In the relationship which is thus emerged, it is only the character of positive universality that is at first observed and developed, but a further side presents itself which must also be taken into consideration, to wit. If the many determinate properties were strictly indifferent to one another, if they were simply and solely self-related, they would not be determinate, for they are only determinate insofar as they differentiate themselves from one another and relate themselves to others as to their opposites. Yet, as thus opposed to one another, they cannot be together in the simple unity of their medium, which is just as essential to them as negation. The differentiation of the properties, insofar as it is not an indifferent differentiation, but is exclusive, each property negating the others, thus falls outside of this simple medium. And the medium, therefore, is not merely and also an indifferent unity, but is a one as well, a unity which excludes an other. The one is the moment of negation. It is itself quite simply a relation of self to self, and it excludes an other, and it is that by which thinghood is determined as a thing. Negation is inherent in a property as a determinateness which is immediately one with the immediacy of being, an immediacy which, though this unity with, through this unity with negation, is universality. As a one, however, the determinateness is set free from this unity with its opposite and exists in and for itself. In section 113, we saw that Hegel finished up by talking about what provided the thinghood to the thing. It was this also of the medium that, that's tying the properties together in some sort of whole. Now in, in section 114, he's going to talk again about universality and remind ourselves too that each one of these properties can be understood as a universality of some sort. You know, a property like sweetness or being cubical applies to many things. But each of these are a sensuous universality and in a certain respect an immediacy as well for the perceiver. And here he's going to focus exclusively on the object of perception, not on the perceiver. That's going to run through the, this paragraph and the next paragraph, and then we're going to come back to the perceiver in a moment. And we want to see how things are playing themselves out. We got ourselves to a point where we realized that the medium is, is very important. That's what allows these different properties to exist as themselves in relation to each other, because they can't exist as themselves solely out there in space, by themselves independently. Notice too, this is a little bit of a, a digression, but I think it's worth, worth pointing out, that if we think about traditional metaphysics prior to Hegel, um, if we use, you know, for example, Locke and Aristotle as examples, Aristotle would talk about substance and then the accidents or the, predic the predicates of that substance. So man is a substance, white or red or black or green or whatever you want, um, rational, uh, we can have things like good, bad, all those are, are accidents, all those are, are predicates. Those are all properties, they're Eigenschaften in, in, in the sense that we're talking about here. And what's really much more important is the, the substance or the subject, the, the thing that, that allows them to exist as, as what they are. For John Locke, you know, in the modern period, we can't really know for most substances what they, they are in themselves. All we can really know are the properties which we predicate of them. And again, those properties are things that for the most part we take in by the senses and we have words for them. But what's really allowing them to exist as properties is the substance in which they're in some sort of way supposed to inhere. And it gets a li little bit more complicated than that. You know, we have primary and secondary properties. I don't want to get too far into those, those details. But what's really interesting to see here, what you don't see in Locke and you don't see in Aristotle and you don't see in, in a lot of previous thinkers, is the idea that it's these properties themselves and their relations to each other 
that make them what they are. Not just their you know, adherence or inherence in whatever the, the subject or substance happens to be, but rather something more at the level of their relations with each other. So how does Hegel put this? He says, um, the, if the many determinate properties were strictly indifferent to each other. <clears throat> so in salt, for example, we've been using that because Hegel likes that example, the whiteness and the cubicality, we'll call it, the having you know, a cubical nature, and the tartness, we could differentiate them all out and say, well, you know, you got your whiteness here, you got your cubicality here, you've got your, your tartness or saltiness here, and you just put them together in this thing, and this also, in, this, in German, auch, and now you get salt. And that seems to be the way that somebody like Locke, for example, thinks about substances and thinks about properties. Hegel says, no, no, these are differentiating themselves. I put different here just because, you know, I don't want to put differentiate because it's a lot more right. But they're differentiating themselves from each other. I should probably also have done uh, this as well, right? These properties are also in relation in that way. And it's insofar as they, they differentiate themselves from an other and from an other other that they are able to be determinate. They are able to be bestimmt, as, as Hegel says. They have a, a sort of um, reality to them, a sort of describability, you might say. And so he says, if the determinate properties were indifferent to each other, if they were simply and solely self-related, if you could understand them just on their own basis, as universals, then um, they would not be determinate. They're only determinate insofar as they differentiate from the, themselves from one another. They relate themselves to their other as, as what the, the translator has here, as opposites. Um, the, the, the German is actually a little bit more active. When we think about opposites, that's a very passive way to think about it. They are literally entgegengesetzt, which means put down, gesetzt, uh, entgegen, against each other, opposed to each other. They are being, you know, brought into relation as things that don't, that don't really go. Now, they are able to coexist in the same thing, as we've seen in previous paragraphs, but they have a kind of um, agency, you might say, or, or a, a relief. They're, they stand out against each other. That's what it means for them to be and gain gazettes in this sort of situation. So he says, as a thus opposed to one another, they cannot be together in the simple unity of their medium which is just as essential to them as negation. So what's the medium? The medium so far is this also, this, this out, this, you've got this and this and this and this. The thing allows there to be whiteness and cubicality and tartness and, you know, graininess or whatever else we want to say, you know, um, about, about salt, dryness. And this is not able to support what's going on down here. So we have an important transition that's going to take place. I just wanted to make the arrow a little bit more distinct. And we move from the also to the one, the eins. He says, um, the differentiation of the properties, insofar as it's not an indifferent differentiation, but is exclusive, each one of these negating the others, each one of these pushing the others away, falls outside of this simple medium. The also can't keep it all there, bound up together. We have to have something that's got a bit more, you might say, metaphysical depth to it, a little bit more solidity, and that's the one. This is what gives the, the thingness to the thing, right? The ding height uh, for the, the ding, the, the, the thing. So he says... Um, it's not merely an also, but a one as well, a unity which excludes an other. Salt is not chalk, even though they have whiteness and, I guess, dryness in common. They exclude others, and they are a relation to themselves. They, they exclude others precisely by 
relating to themselves. Now, this sounds very abstract. What is Hegel talking about here? He's, he's merely stressing that a thing is what it is by being what it is, being in an active way, in such a way as it excludes other things. It says, I am not that. So it's not only a negation happening down here at this level, it's also negation happening up here at, you might say, the, the higher level. And these two interpenetrate each other. So the whiteness of the chalk may not be the same thing as the whiteness of the salt. That's why we can differentiate different whites, right? So he goes on and he says, The one is the moment of negation. It's simply a relation of self to self. It excludes another. It's that by which thinghood is determined as a thing. So we're getting away from just thinghood, or thingness, dingheit, to an actual thing. And when we perceive, which is what we're trying to talk about here, do we perceive thingnesses out there, thing-like, you know, entities, or do we perceive actual things? That's where we want to go with this. So he goes on and he, he's bringing this to a, a close here, and he says, Negation is inherent in a property as a determinateness, which is immediately one with the immediacy of being, an immediacy which, through this unity with negation, is universality. That's how properties can be universals. We're seeing a new side now of what, what has been discussed previously. So he says, as a one, though, the determinateness is set free from this unity with its opposite. And here he says something really interesting. It exists in and for itself. That's, whenever we see in and for itself, We've got things that have been brought to a kind of close, at least for the moment. Now that we're going to have a lot of development going on after this, but whenever we see in and for itself, we've got kind of a Hegelian hiatus, a little, a little step where we can say, aha, what can we survey now? That's what we want to look at as we move into the next paragraph. In these moments taken together, the thing as the truth of perception is completed, so far as it is necessary to develop it here. It is, first, an indifferent passive universality, the also of the many properties, or rather, matters. Second, negation, equally simple, or the one, which excludes opposite properties. And third, the many properties themselves, the relation of the first two moments, or negation as it relates to the indifferent element, and there it expands into a host of differences. The point of singular individuality in the medium of subsistence radiating forth into plurality. Insofar as these differences belong to the indifferent medium, they are themselves universal, they are related only to themselves, and do not affect one another. But, insofar as they belong to the negative unity, they are at the same time exclusive of other properties, but they necessarily have this relationship of opposition to properties remote from there also. The sensuous universality or the immediate unity of being and the negative is thus a property only when the one and the pure universality are developed from it and differentiated from each other, and when the sensuous universality unites them. It is this relation of the universality as the pure essential moments which at last completes the thing. Section 115 is, is tracing out the same movement that was just made in section 114, looking at it from slightly different vantage points and trying to consolidate it. So Hegel is going to talk about um, three things, which your text actually puts as A, B, and C, and we can write them up here in a kind of chart that represents a movement that's taking place, a movement in our own thinking in the metaphysics of, of objects as well. And I want to point out here that when he's talking about the thing as the truth of perception in English, I suppose too in some other languages that might be uh, where we're using similar cognates, we can lose uh, a little bit of the play on words that's going on, or at least the resonances that are happening, because Hegel is using the same term here. You notice in the German, it's the Vara, the Wahrnehmung. Right? Wahrnehmung is perception. We've talked about this previously 
It literally means the taking of the truth of something. And so why is he so concerned with the truth of the thing or the truth of perception? Because that's what it is to perceive, to take truth, to grasp the thing as what is true, as what is available, as what is there, not as what is wrong, what is false, or something like that. We're going to hit on that a little bit later. So the thing as the truth of perception, there's three moments in this development. You don't want to get too caught up with the thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing that people want to pigeonhole Hegel into here, because these are all actually tied together. These are three different moments, and this one, the properties, turns out to uh, include a whole plethora of moments. The one also does as well, because the one excludes another. So let's follow out this progression. We begin with the, the also, and he says that um, it's an indifferent passive universality. What do, we, what do we mean by this? So the thing itself is a universality. Um, I'm going to get away from the, the salt example for a little bit and just use the piece of chalk again. So we have a thing as a passive universality. This piece of chalk, this piece of chalk, they have you know, the same properties. They're almost the same size, uh, actually. Um, not exactly the same, but they may look the same to you. They're white, they're chalky, I know we shouldn't de define things circularly, but you know what I mean. They're, there's a chalkiness to it. They have a kind of sound to them. They're hard, they're dry. All those properties are bound together in this also. That's the medium. The, these pieces of chalk are a medium in which we find these properties displaying themselves displaying themselves as something true to the perceiver. There's a grasping of the truth. The truth of this is whiteness, is chalkiness, is dryness. So we have that going on. And like he says, that's passive. It's uh, the also of many properties or rather matters. That's a beginning point. And then we move to the one. And when we get to the one, we have real things, not just thingness or thing likeness, but actual things. This is a one. This is not the same one as this one, even though they're very similar. These are different from each other. They exclude each other. And they don't just exclude each other by the fact that I can't push them both into the same place. Um, they exclude each other in a, in a metaphysical way. So we've got negation coming to the fore there. We have exclusion. And not just at the level of the, the higher objects, the things that we can see as objects, but also the properties. That's leading us here into the properties. So he says the many properties themselves, the relation of the first two moments. How are the properties, the relation of the also and the one? Because those properties are properties for both the also and for the one, which is the same thing, just being looked at in two different ways by the perceiver. That's a little bit of what Hegel's not telling you that's going on behind the scenes there. And so each of these properties is going to be doing something quite interesting. We begin with the properties, as he says, um, you know, starting out uh, as in, in the indifferent element, uh, expanding to a host of differences, a, a plurality. We have a unity becoming a plurality. And he says, insofar as these differences belong to the universal medium themselves, they are themselves universal. So each of these properties is a universal, as we've seen. So like whiteness is, is a universal. Whiteness is here in the chalk. Whiteness is also uh, here in this chalk as well. Whiteness is in the chalk on the board. Whiteness is all over the place. So is blackness. So is blueness, I suppose. So is corduroyness as you're, as you're watching this, right? How do you know it's corduroy? It makes that weird sound. Um, anyway, back to the Hegel. That, that's a little bit of a digression. So as we're moving from looking at the properties from the perspective of the also, where each of the properties is merely related to itself and is a universal, a sensuous universal, and we're moving to the perspective of the one, where now we have exclusion. Now we have something like activity going on. He says, um, 
Insofar as these differences are, are just in the universal medium, they don't affect each other, but insofar as they belong to this negative unity of the one, the negative unity that excludes the other, they are at the same time exclusive of other properties. But they necessarily have this relationship of opposition of properties remote from their also. What does that mean? They have this, this they're differentiating from each other. We saw this. But the also was going to let them do whatever they wanted to do, pretty much. It's pretty passive. The properties are also differentiating themselves from the properties found in the other. So this chalk, the whiteness of this chalk, not only differentiates itself from the dryness of the chalk, this chalk, it differentiates itself from the dryness of this chalk and the whiteness of this chalk. That's part of what it means for this exclusion to be going on. And, you know, if we follow this out further, which Hegel's not doing here, this other is another one, isn't it? So this entire thing is also contained here, and all of that is happening in that direction as well, with all of the properties involved there. That's a lot to think about, I think. A lot to think about, I think. That's kind of a silly thing to say. Anyway, he goes on and he says, um, the sensuous universality, or the immediate unity of being in the negative, is thus a property only when the one and the pure universality are developed from it and differentiated from each other, and when the sensuous universality unites them. It's this which then at last completes the thing. So in a certain way, properties are not quite yet properties when we're just dealing with this. When we're letting them be what they are, you know, it, we're in a certain sense more abstract with it. Properties are properties as sensuous universalities, like whiteness, like dryness, precisely by differentiating themselves, by opposing themselves to other properties, and by doing that through the mediation of the one, by not being the one, but at the same time being something that is a component of the one. This, then, is how the thing of perception is constituted and consciousness is determined as percipient insofar as this thing is its object. It has only to take it, to confine itself to a pure apprehension of it, and what is thus yielded is the true. If consciousness itself did anything in taking what is, what is given, it would, by such adding or subtraction, alter the truth. Since the object is the true and universal, the self-identical, while consciousness is alterable and unessential, it can happen that consciousness apprehends the object incorrectly and deceives itself. The percipient is aware of the possibility of deception. For in the universality, which is the principle, otherness itself is immediately present for him, though present as what is null and superseded. His criterion of truth is therefore self-identity, and his behavior consists in apprehending the object as self-identical, since the same, at the same time diversity is explicitly there for him. It is a connection of the diverse moments of his apprehension to one another. But, if a dissimilarity makes itself felt in the course of this comparison, then this is not an untruth of the object, for this is self-identical, but an untruth in perceiving it. If you've been wondering, well, where is the perceiving subject in all of this? We've been looking at the thing and its properties and all this really interesting stuff going on. In section 116, we're bringing back the subject, the perceiving consciousness, into the equation. But notice what's going to happen. I'm going to sort of just spell it out right at the start. Anything that's wrong, anything that's untrue, is going to fall entirely on the side of and in the responsibility of, you might say, consciousness. Anything 
that's good, real, is all going to be on the side of the object. And when you see something like that, you should, you should immediately say, that's probably not going to last very long. But it is going to last for this paragraph, so let's see how this plays out for Hegel. We've come to the point where now we, we realize that the thing is the true, the true uh, thing of perception. And perception is true when consciousness, as the subject, is, is perceiving the thing as it is. It's just perceiving the thing without any sort of blockage or filtering, without any what he's going to call adding or subtracting. And we're going to come right back to that in just a moment. But I want to uh, go through some of this, this terminology. So he says, Consciousness is determined as percipient insofar as it has a thing as its object. It only has to take it. It only has to grab onto it. Again, we see that perceiving, varnemon, varnemon means um, to grab the true, to, to hold on to the true, to take the true to oneself. And so what's going to happen in this is insofar as consciousness is grasping the true that's, that's there, so far as it's replicating the true within itself, you might say, it is getting things right. What is it getting right? Well, it's going to be grasping the thing as a universal, so something that's intelligible, something that it can make sense of, something that it can bring into language, as we've seen, and it's grasping it as self-identical. He says, since the object of the, is the true and universal, the self-identical, while consciousness itself is alterable and unessential, it can happen that consciousness loses track of things and ends up deceiving itself. Why? Because consciousness is actually going to be deceiving itself in a double way here. It wants to grasp the thing or the, the true in perception as self-identical. That means that, does it relate itself to otherness? No. It, it sort of dispels otherness from itself. So the thing becomes something that should not be other than what it is. And, and here we're now in the realm of A equals A, nothing but A, right? Hegel's going to take us away from that in a moment, but he wants to, to make this as stark as possible. So he says, um, the, the criterion of truth becomes self-identity and behavior, good behavior on the part of consciousness, consists in apprehending the object as self-identical. The piece of chalk is what it is, and that's it. Nothing more. Insofar as I add anything to it, insofar as I take anything away from it, over here, now I'm changing the thing. What does that mean? That means that what I'm doing is incorrect. I'm not getting the thing as it is because I'm not letting the thing be self-identical. I'm trying to push, you know, postulate or push or, or project my own nonsense onto it, but I'm just an inessential consciousness. I'm just the perceiver. I'm not, I don't have the dignity of the object, right? And this means that it's possible for consciousness to cause its own deception. Something that we ought to think about as an aside is whether this whole process here, this whole picture that we've got, isn't itself a way that consciousness sometimes deceives itself in modern philosophy and in naive uh, grasp on, on perception. In any case, we're going to want to, if we're good consciousnesses, don't do any of this, right? Just stick with this, and then we're going to be A-OK. -okay. We, we grasp the truth as such. We don't want to be caught in deception. If we are, it's our own fault. We're the ones who impose that upon ourselves. Like, you know, Descartes says, for example, in his meditations, when I'm deceived, I, I can, you know, say that there's some sort of evil deceiver out there, but that evil deceiver can't really deceive me if I actually stick to what I know and don't add or subtract anything. He doesn't use those words, but that's Hegel's terms. So he, he goes on and he says, the percipient is aware of the possibility of deception. And once you open up the door to possibly being deceived, you know what rabbit hole that turns out to be. And he says, um, since at the same time diversity is explicitly there for him, it's a connection of diverse moments of his apprehension to one another. 
If a dissimilarity makes itself felt in the course of this comparison, then this is not an untruth of the object. No, not on the side of the object. The object can be inert. The object can be passive. The object can even be eternal. If there is some sort of difference, if there's some sort of change, if there's some sort of mutability, it must be on the side of the subject. The untruth lies over here. So he says, um, an untruth in perceiving it. Is this going to be a position that we can continue to, to stick with? Well, we're going to see Hegel's going to move away from this, but we want to see very clearly what this stance consists in. So to sum up where we've gotten to at this point, the thing is the true. Perception, insofar as it participates in truth, insofar as it's grasping truth, has to be consciousness letting the object be exactly what it is, be self-identical. And insofar as there's anything that's changing or fluctuating or any sort of alterity, any sort of otherness, any sort of opposition going on, that's on the side of consciousness, and that's probably an index of deception that consciousness is carrying out for itself, applying to itself. It's causing its own untruth.